begin Sadhguru? It is said, God created man with due respect to the ladies. No creation will be complete without you. There's just a rib. There's just one rib. Yes. <laughs> but the feeling is that the biggest achievement of man was that he invented God, a God for himself. Our biggest invention was that he created a God for himself. Now, you know, we were in Oaxaca, uh, one of the tribal areas in Mexico, and our host took us to in a remote area. Of, there was a big shell of a church, and very long actually, like this. And there was dark inside, but we saw several groups of 20, 30 people sitting and singing and drinking and burning incenses and each one of each of one of the group they had their own God there. So in that hall there must have been 15, 20 different looking gods. So we wanted to know the story. The story was that each of each one of them they make their own God in the liking of their own vision of themselves, how a God should look. And they begin to pray, Sadhguru. And then they also pray for good life and well-being. And when the God doesn't help them, they get very angry. They break his hand. This God is useless. And then after some time, a few days later, if he doesn't do anything, they break his other arm then he break, break his leg and then they break him, throw him away and make another god. Now, which I thought was very creative. That, uh, that culture is very much uh, present in India, especially in Bastar. Yeah. Every year, uh, they destroy the gods who not uh, perform well. Fine. <laughs> so what is your vision of God? Is it a concept or a myth or a reality that keeps changing with the ages? Namaskar to everyone. See, so, yeah. because human beings have no, no perception of what is the nature of creation or what is the source of creation. The idea of God is something that's come out of this that we know we did not create all this. Something must have created this. Being human, we think somebody must have created this. And being human, we think it must be in a human form. But if we make him or her just like us, they look little incompetent just like us. So we add a couple of more hands or heads to make them little larger than ourselves. But essentially, this is to fill that gap of ignorance about the nature of our existence and the source of our existence. So, there are cultures, for example in India and now you're talking in Mexico, I don't know how that can happen in a church, because in a church you can't destroy the God. It's, it's, a, it's not a living church, it's a shell of a church where these tribals have okay. taken over. So, in this culture, <laughs> as you know most of you, you have your own yeah, Ishta Devata. That means in this garden, if you like this tree, you can start worshipping this tree, in this country, nobody thinks uh, there's anything odd about it. You're talking about this tree? No, no, no. <laughs> Trees that bear fruit. <laughs> how, do you, how do you know that I don't bear fruits? <laughs> Not those who drop pictures. <laughs> drop me. Catch <laughs> 
So, nobody thinks anything odd if you suddenly start worshipping that rock in the garden. This is a country where if you start worshipping a rock at the street corner, people know everybody who goes by also just yes. pass down and go. Well, it's not their God, but it's your God, so everybody pass down for that also. You never know which God will bless you eventually. Mm, that's not the point. The question is not about blessing. Blessing is of a different nature. But when we talk about God, we must understand, first of all, there never was a concept of God in these cultures. It's purely from the Abrahamic cultures where the God appeared. Here, you can worship the tree, you can worship the rock, you can worship a stone, you can worship a stick, you can worship a mountain, you can worship a cow, snake, elephant, monkey, whatever you like. Because the culture evolved from the understanding that there is no piece of creation where there isn't an active participation of that which we call as a source of creation. Whether you take a single atom or the cosmos or in between everything else, in every particle of creation, there is an active participation of that which we call as the source of creation. So, either you saw everything as divine or nothing as divine. Both ways it will work. The moment you say, this is sacred and this is filthy, you will never make it because you have divided the universe. The division of the universe has happened only in the human mind, nowhere else. In the existence, nothing can be divided. It's all happening as one massive happening. It's only in the human intellect that it's divided, that something is sacred, something is filthy, something is good, something is bad. This is a, a very juvenile way of using one's intellect, which is new for the human being. When I say new, in the evolutionary scale of things, this level of cerebral activity, this level of intellect is a new happening. Still people have not figured how to use it. They are using it only to divide, they are not using it to penetrate. You said we looked for God in human bodies, which is also the fact no, that… No, they, they did not look for gods in human bodies. No, because… Their imagination is such, because we are like this, we think God should be a big me. Yeah, precisely that. I mean, sorry. Now, Gautam Buddha, Christ, Guru Nanak, Allah, and even Ram and Krishna came in human body. I'm not sure about Ram and Krishna because they were maybe mythologically <laughs> what different people. You? But you're saying Allah <laughs> I must say, I must say that whenever I am in problem, sometimes they say, oh Allah, please help me. When in another situation I can say, oh Christ, Christ, why are we stuck here? Ram or Krishna to bahut baad mein aate hain. This is how it has been happening. No, I didn't believe Muhammad. Allah did not walk the planet. Oh. Yeah, Muhammad, all right. Now, he is what the God's people worship till today. But uh, if my understanding is correct, and maybe Sadhguru will add another dimension, that maybe these individuals in the form of a human body they were connected with the divine, with the supreme energy, and they were pure souls, so if they touched anybody, they could heal those people, or they could do something magical for them. And they've come and gone, because when Ram Mandir was being demolished, no Ram came down to protect it. Babri must be saying it, no, no Allah, no Muhammad came down. So where have they gone? Why are we still waiting? Why are we still stuck? See, these stories of uh, magic 
don't belong to our country or our culture. Here, the Ram went through all the trials and tribulations that every man goes through and ten times over. What is it that did not go wrong in his life? Just everything. I'm saying, uh, the man is born as a king, a rightful he corner coronated, then due to some whatever jealousy, he loses his kingdom and goes to the jungle with his new, newly married wife. And the Sri Lankan people come and clean up his wife. And then he goes down looking for her. And then, you know, with the Tamil army, don't do that, please. <laughs> With the Tamil army, he wages a war. That is that time. Huh? Really, it was Tamil army. Huh? Sure, sure. The Danish court is where they crossed over. So they fight a war, a war that he doesn't like to fight, but he fights because he thinks it's his dharma to get back his wife. And being a king, if somebody took away his wife, he would have found a local solution. But. The man loves his wife to such an extent that from Ayodhya down to Sri Lanka, he walks and fights a battle, burns down a beautiful city, gets back his wife. Then a few months of togetherness and she's pregnant. At that time again something political brews up and as a responsible king, he feels that he should not put down the sanctity of his throne and a dear wife that he loves. He loves her enough to walk all the way down, wage a battle and get her back and now she sends her into the forest once again, fully pregnant. And for a king it's very important to have a hair. When the woman is pregnant, how would he send her away? Not knowing whether it's boys or girls, no son of them to tell him what the hell is happening. And she goes in the jungle and delivers two boys. Unknowingly, he fights a battle with his own children. If there is anything truly horrible <laughs> in your life, knowing we are an enemy, you kill your own children. He almost did it. He's a senior disaster. Yes. You don't want me to be killed. No. It's a, I'm telling you. He's a senior disaster, but we do not worship him for his magic. We do not worship because he did miracles. We do not worship because he's a super success. We worship him because even though life did all these things to him, he did not become resentful. He did not lose his balance. He did not become angry and hateful. No matter what happened, he maintained his balance. And when he came back after the battle with Ravana and killed him, he said, we need to go to Himalayas to do penance. Lakshmana said, are you out of your mind? The man stole your wife and you want to do penance for his death. So Rama said, out of his ten heads, nine were different types of evil. But one head was that of a Shiva's devotee. I killed a devotee. For that I need to do penance. And he went to Himalayas to do penance. This is the man. It is for this balance that we are shifting. Not for stupid miracles. People who have got ailments have to know that the ailment and healing of the ailment by coming out of the ailment or dying for the ailment is their business. Nobody should interfere with that. Well, Sadhguru, I have started slightly different feeling about this. That because of his sacrifice, because of this, and because he. No, I didn't say the sacrifice. I didn't, did not do all about that. I am saying the balance. Yeah, all right. But for, you see, the problem with Hindus, Hinduism is that we've been such mind-loving, caring people that our neighbors kick us nicely and properly. And uh, throwing your wife away because somebody said something, I thought it was very uh, cowardly. See, the thing is, uh, you are an individual person. You can hold your wife whichever way you want. But uh, when you have taken the responsibility of a nation, your responsibility for the people is bigger than the responsibility for your family. That's what you exhibit. And I wish the leaders of today 
the leaders of today in this country and in every country showed that responsibility, that your responsibility for the nation is way bigger than your responsibility for your family. Okay, then, you see, also I feel these days more people, many more people, many thousands, they go to temples, they go to mosques, they go to the Dwaras, to churches, to the religious celebrations. And despite the fact that many more people are engaged in such whatever kind of religious activities, the religion has become the biggest weapon against mankind not only by the extremists, but also by the politicians. So where are we going? In the name of the religion. Well, uh, it's not that people are doing politics in the name of religion. Religion is politics. Really? That yes. Is no, let me come to this. When religions are only thinking of how to add numbers to themselves, it's only about increasing the demographics that you can cover. Obviously it's politics, power politics. Otherwise why would you be interested in the numbers all the time? Yes, beautiful. Yes. We are being an ancient civilization where Adi Yogi to the Hindus here, Adi Shankaracharya, they never preached Hinduism as such. And they talked about explorations of mankind beyond the limits of where we live. Intolerance in the name of religion is a painful feeling. When we think of Guru, we need to reinvent rewrite a holy book born out of instinctive revelations so suited to the whole mankind. Would you like to do that? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm not somebody who is preparing to write one more book. Well, the book written by the ancient sages and seers, book spoken by Krishna, today is Janmashtami, all this can be interpreted and misinterpreted. Why would I write one more book and do the same folly? So, what I'm creating is a spiritual factory. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It doesn't matter who comes, we've set up processes. Within three days, four days, we make sure they experience something. Not teach something but to experience something, not believe something, but to experience something. If enough people carry the experience, I have no doubt they will share it with the next generation for sure, one hundred percent. And what makes you think that generation won't, won't share it with the next generation? They will also do that. It is just that you have to give them something precious enough that they can carry within themselves. About this question that you're asking about tolerance and intolerance, if there is… you have traveled everywhere in the world and so have I, if there is any society that you can call as truly tolerant, it's this culture. Let's not forget that. Which other culture can be battered for a thousand years by invaders and still we accept the people and we are okay with it as long there is no more further aggression. Which other culture will do it? They will hit back. You go to the United States and see, you just saw what happened with 9-11. Just one building you knocked down. They burned down three countries, all right? Hello? They just literally burnt out three nations because one building came down. How many things have happened to you even in the last seventy years? Forget about the thousand years. We are not thinking of burning down anybody. We are only trying how to protect our lives and go on with it. We may burn an individual here and there. That's all. 
we may burn an individual here and there. Say, this burning of individuals, you must understand this. Uh, I have lived in rural India. I have personally witnessed three lynchings myself. Two of them were killed. One of them was almost killed but he survived. One of them was killed because my news just spread out all over that somebody is coming and going to kidnap your children because a dam is being built and children are being sacrificed. I just tried to inquire where the dam dam is being built. Nobody knows where the dam dam is being built and which any family lost one child, nobody has lost a child, but it's on in all these villages, it's just spread. This is before cell phone and social media. Just by word, people are going on bicycles and telling everybody, children are being stolen, be careful, be careful. In the night, vigilante is standing there with, you know, having fires burning and standing there with sticks and waiting. And somebody came, unfortunately, somebody who was looking city-like, not like a village like, he was little, somewhere else he came from. Nobody inquired what is his religion, what is his caste, what is his creed, they beat him to death. And on the street they're beating him to death and I just rode down and I just got up and I tried to stop this. They pushed me aside and said, this is not your business. And they killed him and buried him right there, just outside the village in front of everybody. And there was a huge joy, roar of joy that we killed the child lifter and the sub-inspector of a police station which was just about eight kilometers away was a friend of mine, he was my senior in the college. I went there and I told him this happened. I can show you where it's buried. You need to do something. He said, don't you get into this. I said, why? He said, this is the way it's done. You just leave it. I said, you cannot leave it like this. But no. When I really looked at it, the problem is this. Suppose your child is stolen. Let's say you're living in a remote village. Your child is stolen. Where will you go and get them in this country? Do you know, every year, about 17 to 18 thousand children below six years of age go missing and they're never found? Hello? Do you know this? Between 12 and 18, nearly thirty-five to forty thousand girls disappear and they never found again. Do you know this? So, if your child goes missing, where are you going to find them? What system do you have in the country that somebody is going to go and locate your child and bring them back to you? So what do you do? I'm asking, what do you do? So people get paranoid. Any strange face that comes into you, the village, he gets it. Nobody will ask a question, are you the child lifter? <laughs> Simply it just happens like that. So unfortunately, the reach of law in this country has not touched the full geography of this nation. For 1.3 billion people, how many policemen do you have? How much equipment do you have? Can yes. you really enforce law? Are you capable of this, the system? No. Law will work only for those who are well-to-do and who are living in cities. You can give a complaint, you can push somebody in the local MLA and get something done. Not in remote villages. Nobody goes there. The police station is 15-20 kilometers away. If you call them, they'll come after three days. And you think they're going to search for your child if it's lost? So there is paranoia about these things. These things are being misunderstood. The same goes for cows. When a cow is stolen, People get beaten, it doesn't matter which community they are. It's all being made up like it's against a particular community. I want you to know this every year. Every calendar year, over hundred uniformed men, including BSF soldiers, getting killed because of cow smugglers. They kill them. You think they're giving them slow tranquilizers and giving them a peaceful death? They're being beaten and stoned to death. Please ask the police forces. Over 100 policemen die in this country simply being killed by cattle smugglers. And how are cattle smuggled? 
it is stolen all over the country and moved towards Bangladesh border at one time. It was also going to Pakistan border, but that's been tightened considerably now. Largely, it is moving towards Bangladesh border. Millions of cows, three and a half to four million cattle cross Bangladeshi border every year. Every cow is worth around thirty to forty thousand rupees, so it's big money and they will kill anybody who comes in the way. Now when they catch them once in a way, these people also kill. I am not saying this is right. Law has to be enforced means first thing the borders have to be sealed, absolutely. This business has to stop. You must understand, people are thinking that they're killing because it's a Gomatha. No. Cattle are property. It's their wealth. If you take away my cattle, I won't have livelihood. You need to understand this. This is all made out in the media as if they're killing because their um, cow is sacred. That's not the point. No, sir. Cow is money. That is a slogan. The So, this is all being motivated projections of things, let's not get carried away by this. Unfortunately, in this country, still law is enforced by the mob, this way or that way, this has to stop. Law should be enforced by law enforcement yes. agencies, but do we have the necessary agencies? Do we have the strength of agency to deliver law to every citizen in this country? No, not yet. Hope we get there soon. Yes, you are very right in this. So, Sadhguru, what is creative expression? Where does it come from? Is divinity part of creative explorations? See, people think, uh, I know this is, I'm sorry if I say something wrong. <laughs> because I don't think anybody can create anything. Everything that can be created is already created. If we reflect what is being created, it's fantastic. In a photograph, in a, in a painting, in a drawing, or in what we say, words, poetry, essentially we are only capturing a bit of creation. We are not creating anything at any point. Absolutely. So where is the divine? I thought they're in your pictures. <laughs> that was you in my pictures, said you. I know that the, the divinity that you have. Now lastly I must say one thing. God himself has been so unfair and uncaring if there is God. There are rich, there are poor, there are small guys, there are big guys, there are all kinds of faces, there is a country which has beautiful weather throughout the year and we have hot summer and floods happening now and anything. So God himself has been so unfair to the world. Is there ever going to be a day of redemption? Because even according to me, God will also get punished in the process. See these childish ideas that we've been, that's been spreading in the world by certain people that God will reward you, God will punish you, God will make you, take you to heaven or God will throw you in hell. These are childish nonsense because… But Sadhguru, more than eighty percent of the world you know, believes in these stories, what to do? Well, <laughs> see a majority can win an election. A majority has not become enlightened or become wise either, unfortunately. So, numbers matter. Only for political power. Numbers do not matter. For wisdom, Numbers did not, does not matter for clarity. Numbers does not matter for enlightenment. Numbers matter only for politics. 
So majority they have joined, as I said, it is not that people are playing politics with religion, largely religion is politics, it's about numbers. Anybody who goes about desperately trying to add numbers to their religion is obviously political. There's no question about it. Desmond Tutu put this very well. He said, the missionaries came to Africa and they had a holy book in their hand. They gave it to us and asked us to close our eyes and pray. We did not know anything holy, we just knew land. We had land and we just knew land. But they had a holy book. They gave the holy book to us and asked us to pray. We closed our eyes and prayed. When we opened our eyes, we had the holy book. They had the land. land. <laughs> yes. So last on a personal note, can I? I was married once. I've been married again. At this point of time, 75, 76, as sometimes you refer to me as old man, which is not fair, but nevertheless you are such good so it's okay. No, the very, uh, <laughs> the very fact you're trying to cover it. No, 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 not at all. No, you see, so coming back to my question, that I'm married for the second time and we've been together for over 30 years, and the other day I was telling my wife that I think, you know, my mission on this planet is still incomplete and I think I'm coming back. And she said very quickly, but I'm not coming back. <laughs> no. She is wise. <laughs> but I'm talking about the spirit. Wisdom doesn't take you beyond uh, these levels of dealing with each other, you know. But the fact is that third time I could be looking for another wife, you know. This is my problem, so I want an answer. I don't think we'll have any problem. Say, <laughs> <laughs> so look, Spirit, with your blessings, <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much. I was just being a little naughty with you. I would uh, like to say that uh, unfortunately I was simply not happy with what was being projected. It's, it's, uh, it's not doing justice to what the pictures are. The pictures are so not significant, not because it's a Dashram or me or Adiyogi. The pictures are significant because, uh, I don't know, I, I really don't know how many pictures people have taken of me. It should be millions. But uh, Raghu did capture something. I wouldn't say in every picture, but in a few pictures he captured something that nobody ever captured, which I'm always conscious of. When I say I'm always conscious of, the entire system of yoga is essentially in the physical dimension, it's about geometry of existence. One way of looking at the yogic process is, it's about making your personal geometry in such a way that it aligns and reflects the cosmic geometry. If geometrically two things become congruent, in many ways they become one. So the entire yogic system is about that. And you think that I'll manage to capture? <laughs> Don't reward yourself so soon. <laughs> You're taking too long, I'm resting a soul. <laughs> if I, uh, you know, if I just look at a tree, right from my childhood it's like this for me. First thing that registers for me is the entire geometry of the tree. I don't see the colors, I don't see the shades, 
The first thing I see is the geometric way it's standing. So my draw for any form is because of its geometry, not necessarily because of its color and other aspects of, I would say, surface beauty. The real beauty of anything is in its geometry. Physical form, the beauty is in its geometry. So, uh, <laughs> you can wait, okay? <laughs> so, uh, when people picture you, or when people see you, people would like to see you or capture you, or even if they've captured other things, the things that they reject are the most valuable pictures. Because they will look for a picture which is nice, proper, smiling, facing, you know, a certain way. But there are other aspects which are not like consciously done, but this is the nature of a yogi, that he becomes geometrically conscious. When I say conscious, not self-conscious about how I stand and how I sit, it's not about that. It is just that you ingrain it into your system that your body naturally settles down in a certain way. In a way, if you want to understand this, you must see how animals sit, not the domestic animals, the wild animals, how they sit, let's say a snake, how it settles down for different purposes, geometrically in a very economical way, minimum moment, maximum impact, always they know how to arrange themselves. It's only human beings who go into all kinds of geometric disorder. <laughs> Most creatures, particularly carnivorous animals, have a, an enormous sense of geometry, how they stand, how they crouch, how they do things. A yogi is like that. He sits, stands and breathes in a certain way so that, because even a slight off means you're losing out something. If you're geometrically reasonably perfect or nearly perfect, you will see you will function with least amount of friction. This is so with any machine. A machine is working very efficiently means what? It's geometrically well aligned. If it's geometrically disaligned, friction will happen. So similarly within a human being, how you sit, stand, breathe, move, this will determine how much energy you expend doing simple activity of life. Those who are geometrically discordant, they will run out of their energies very quickly. Those who are geometrically aligned, you will see their energies will last for a long time. So what I saw <laughs> with the pictures when I first time saw it, what excited me about this is, otherwise it, I thought it's too embarrassing to have a picture book about myself. Uh, but I've been looking at these pictures again and again, <laughs> which is not like me, I don't look at my own photographs, nor do I like to listen to my own talks. <laughs> mm, I've been looking at these particular pictures again and again simply because there are certain aspects of geometry that he caught, which suggests or which translates in the moment if you look at it. This will be the thing I would like all of you to take some time, even if you don't take the book home, to spend some time with the book and look at it. These are still pictures, but at least I would say at least fifteen percent of the pictures, somewhere there is an effect of a video in a still picture. If you look at it for long enough, it like it moves. Because geometrically you got me at a time when I was in a certain way. This, I'm always conscious within myself. Conscious, not like self-conscious, how to do this, how to do that. This is lifetimes of work to build it into your system so that you're always aligned with everything around you. Otherwise, you cannot do things. Today they predicted heavy rain in this part of the city, but uh, see how you're sitting comfortably. <laughs> Because the nature of existence, physical existence, is rooted in its geometry. Geometry not as a subject, geometry as arrangement of physical forms. 
So somewhere I felt there is a certain geometric beauty to some of the pictures, at least fifteen percent of the pictures have captured that moment in such a way, it's not a moment, it's a movement of things. That's what excited me when I saw his first images. I was thinking, he, Raghu went on saying, Sadhguru, you can't treat me like a photographer, I'm not a photographer. Then I said, what the hell are you then? You got a camera, so you're a photographer. He said, no, no, I'm not a photographer. Then as I looked at a few pictures, then I said, okay, and something that I never did till now, I never allowed any photographer to enter my home and shoot pictures. He's the first photographer who entered the house and shot pictures. So, uh, I wanted to enjoy the art behind it, <clears throat> not just seeing your Sadhguru there, but I want you to understand because you need to bring this into your life, that your life in some way has to be geometrically congruent. Only then you live a very smooth life, otherwise everything will be friction, somewhere or other. So, uh, thank you very much, Sadhguru. Thank you. Mala. Thank you, Sadhguru. Uh, last bit. <laughs> Now, you reconfirm my idea or thought about coming back to this planet because you said I have managed to capture 15 percent and 85 percent is a huge amount that I can't afford to give up. You want to come back, that's what you said. Is there anybody who is willing for the third shot at him? <laughs> Not from this class. <laughs> if there is one, that, that has to be only one. Please come on, you, you can't make such an announcement for me.
kindly remain in your places as we request Sadhguru and Prabhuji to please move towards the Veli Temple. And then after a little ceremony there, they move on to the exhibition hall. Please remain in your places, ladies and gentlemen.